بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته All right, so today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to pick up where we left off from yesterday. Again, looking at Mukhtasar Minhaj al Qasidin. Uh, if you remember last time, uh, we were discussing some of the entryways, or I should say doorways, of shaitan into the human heart. We talked about. Does anyone remember? If you were here? Hasid. Hasid and? Al Hirs. Al Hirs is like covetousness. So envy, al Hasid, and Hirs, or craving, or aspirations, worldly aspirations, obviously. Um, and covetousness. The next section here, or the next, I should say, abawab, or the doors of shaitan into the human heart, the Imam mentions al ghadab al shahwa, uh, both anger and desires or impulses, and hidda, which means short tempered. Similar to anger, but you're quick to anger. You have a very short fuse. He says that, uh, rash, he says that anger or ghadab snuffs out rationale. And when you become angry, the army of the mind, and Imam al-Ghazali refers to this quite frequently, the army of different things, the army of the heart, etc. The army of the heart are like the limbs of the body. As we talked about the heart being the king and everything else, uh, being subservient to the heart's direction. And so here he says, Jund uh, al-Aqal, or he should say the soldier of the mind, if you will, uh, becomes weakened, and Shaytan at that point finds the chink in the armor needed to make his attack. And as a result, he begins to play around with people. He begins to play with them. It's actually been reported that Iblis, he says, إِذَا كَانَ الْعَبْدُ حَدِيدًا that if the servant is short-tempered, then we will flip him around, tossing him back and forth like children do when they play with the ball. So to talk about anger, uh, just a little bit to understand what it is that we're after here. Imam al-Ghazali, he says that anger, it is... It's, this is a typical Arabic definition, which is like when the blood boils uh, in order to seek retribution. And there are three levels of anger, according to Imam al-Ghazali. There is uh, anger, which is like a negligent form of anger. Then there's an extreme form of anger. And then there's a moderate, just form of anger. And what we're insinuating is that uh, some anger is good and some is very negative. So the first type, which is considered negligence, this is when a person has lost strength. Uh, they don't anger, uh, especially when it's warranted or justified. And this is typically when a person has no zeal. And this is considered, um, this is considered dispraised when you lack zeal. And the typical, uh, uh, the typical example of this is, is found when, for example, a man has no zeal over the women folk in his family. And so they become very lax to the point that they don't care if, uh, for example, their wife is flirtatious with another man. They lack the anger, uh, if you will, or the zeal when they see those types of things. And so they just have no real reaction to that. The other end of the spectrum is when anger is excessive and extreme. Um, and this is when it conquers, if you will, in a way, uh, the one who's angry. It, it removes them from thinking clearly and making decisions based on their faith. It removes them from the sphere of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And the only thing that remains behind is a person who appears to be out of control. It's as if they're compelled or forced to act. And typically it's based on their emotion. It's like they have no other choice. Uh, it's, it's, it's to such an extreme level. And, and some of us may have experienced this, maybe not personally, but have seen some of the results of this. And one of the most devastating results of this happens in marriages um, when the word divorce is used and abused. Uh, and in my experience uh, in this position, I've seen this devastate households. Out of anger, um, the man says to his wife, you're divorced. And that counts in Islam. You're divorced in Islam. If you're angry, the anger has to be to the point that you don't recall even having said it for it to be dismissed. To be mad and angry Typically, that's when you're going to divorce somebody because you're mad or you're angry. So just the normal level of anger or, or being upset with your spouse is not going to dismiss uh, those words. And then if you couple that with a very, very repugnant cultural practice of saying it three times, then that could mean that the marriage has ended completely and there's no return. And it depends on some details and intentions and the wording that was used. But unfortunately, this is uh, something that's become rather, rather widespread. Husband gets angry, divorces his wife three times, and that's irrevocable divorce, uh, according to the majority of scholars. And then you have to go shopping around for someone to help you get out of that bind. So that as you can see, is an unfortunate, an unfortunate type of, of scenario based on a person's extreme anger. In the middle, there is what's considered moderate or balanced, or we should say just anger, which is praiseworthy. And this is the type of anger that a person has. They are experiencing these feelings, but they're able to wait to receive information from, their, from the rational mind or from the religion. They're not going to act immediately upon their impulse or their emotion, but they're going to utilize that zeal, if you will, or that, that momentum that they have and act based on rational thought as well as religious guidance. They're able to control that anger, so basically they will, they will utilize it when needed and then they will um, control it and have it subside when forbearance is, is better suited for the situation. Um, so you can see this is kind of in the middle of those two extremes. And this is essentially what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, required from us, holds us accountable for, is to have this balance with our emotions and of course, everything is good uh, in moderation. It's a narration that Musa alayhi salam, he met Iblis. He said, Musa, you're the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen with his message and kalamaka takliman, right? He spoke to you. He says, I'm a creature from the creatures of Allah and I've sinned and I want to repent Please go intercede on my behalf with your Lord that he may pardon me. And so Musa alayhi salam, he said, yes. So Musa alayhi salam, he climbed the mountain. He called out to his Lord, Azza wa Jal. And when he wanted to go down the mountain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically said, fulfill your trust. And the trust here is what he agreed to do with Iblis. And he says, oh my Lord, your servant Iblis wants to repent. He wants to seek your forgiveness. And then Allah is with Jal. He uh, inspired Musa and said, oh Musa, you have uh, done what you were requested to do. Order him 
to prostrate to the grave of Adam and he'll be forgiven. Remember, he was ordered to prostrate to Adam while he was alive and he refused to do so out of jealousy. He says, tell him to go prostrate to the grave of Adam. So Musa went down to Iblis and he said, look, I, I did what you asked and you've been ordered to prostrate to the grave of Adam and you'll be pardoned. Iblis, he became angry. Here's the anger part. He became angry and proud. And he said, I didn't prostrate to him while he was alive. Should I prostrate to him now that he's dead? And then Musa said, because of that, you owe me something. I interceded on your behalf. I interceded with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you. So tell me of three things to avoid destruction. And Iblis, he said, remember when you become angry. He says, فَإِنَّ رُوحِي فِي قَلْبِكَ My ruh is in your heart. وَعَيْنِي فِي عَيْنِكَ And my eye is in yours. وَأَجْرِي مِنْكَ مَجْرَ الدَّمْ And I flow through you like blood flows through your veins. He says, remember me when you become angry. For if you do, when man becomes angry, I will blow in him like in his nose and he will not know what to do, how to act. So this is the first thing he said. The second one was, and when you are on the battlefield, basically remember me when you're on the battlefield because I will approach the offspring of Adam when he's on the battlefield and I will remind him of his wife and of his children and of his family until he wants to turn away and flee. And lastly, beware of sitting with a woman who is not from your family. Bidati mahram, basically not someone that you're not allowed to marry. Don't sit with a strange woman. Because I am her messenger. I will send her to you and I will send you to her. And I will not stop until you are tried and tested by her and she is tried and tested by you. So in this narration, not only do we see there's an indication of shahwa, of course, with the opposite gender and anger, there's also al-hirs, which is when you have to flee the battlefield because you're haris ala dunya. And as well, hasid, when Iblis admitted to having refused to prostrate to Adam and with the opportunity to be forgiven, again, that jealousy overcame him along with anger and he would not do so. So there you have anger, desire, short temper, and folded into that, we reiterated the point of envy. The next door, of shaitan into the human heart. Imam says, حُبُّ التزيين فِي المنزل والثياب والأثاث This is loving to decorate your home, clothing, and furnishings. You are being called continuously to build up this world. And typically that comes at the expense of the next to the point that you want to build this life while destroying the next. And so, of course, you don't want to leave. So you beautify its ceilings and its walls. You wear decorative, beautiful clothing, fine furnishings, and man can lose their entire life in this type of opulence. It's a cycle. As said by Imam al-Ghazali, he says that uh, shaitan will come to you and call you to do this, to get into this cycle of decorating and beautifying and, and expanding, etc., your world to the point that once you do one thing, you'll have to do another. And eventually shaitan will leave you and we'll be satisfied that he doesn't have to return because he's put you on a hamster wheel. 
You're just going to continue doing this over and over again. And you're going to continue working your life to do this continuously. And he'll leave you alone doing that while you're running the hamster wheel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions something similar to this in Surah Al-Kahf. Many of us read this on a regular basis. Verses 45 to 46. It says what it means, and give them a parable of this worldly life. It is like the plants of the earth thriving when sustained by the rain we send down from the sky. Then they soon turn into chaff scattered by the wind. And Allah is fully capable of doing all things. Wealth and children are the adornment of this worldly life, but the everlasting good deeds are far better with your Lord in reward and hope. So the parable here is, is the plants that you grow and tend to and care for and water and look after, and eventually they will dry up and they'll die. The Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, he related this this hadith found in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. He sent one of the companions, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, to Bahrain to collect the jizya. The Prophet والسلام, had established a pact, a treaties of peace with the people there, and of course they had to pay that tax. He appointed Al-Ala ibn al-Hadrami as their governor. Abu Ubaidah, he came back from Bahrain with the money, and the Ansar, they heard that he arrived with something. And this time that he arrived coincided with Fajr prayer. The Prophet وسلم, led them in the prayer. Um, and when he was finished, the Ansar, they came to him, والسلام, he looked at them and smiled, seeing them, kind of realizing what they were after. And he said, I feel that you've heard that Abu Ubaidah has brought something back. And of course they said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. And he said, rejoice and hope for what it is that will be pleasing, meaning, there's something here, and hopefully you'll be happy with it. فَوَاللَّهِ لَا الْفَقْرَ أَخْشَى عَلَيْكُمْ وَلَكِنْ أَخْشَى عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ تُبْسَطَ عَلَيْكُمُ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا بُسِطَتْ عَلَى مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ فَتَنَافَسُوهَا كَمَا تَنَافَسُوهَا وَتُهْلِكَكُمْ كَمَا أَهْلَكَتْهُمْ He says, by Allah, I'm not afraid of your poverty, but I am afraid that you will lead a life of luxury as past nations did, whereupon you will compete with each other for it, as they competed with one another, and it will destroy you as it destroyed them. So this is one of the uh, one of the avenues to the human heart. Shaitan uses this door, and that is beautifying the world for consumption, being a, a good consumer. Be a good consumer for Shaitan, and he'll leave you alone. The, the, the next thing we're going to talk about, there's only two very brief ones uh, to wrap up for this session here. Uh, being satiated. This is min abawabihi ashibu, which basically means from food, to eat until you have reached your fill. This is It increases and strengthens your desires. And it distracts you from obedience, being satiated. It's a narration that's mentioned by Imam al-Ghazali. He says that Iblis, he appeared to Yahya ibn Zakariya alayhim as -salam. And Yahya, he saw that Iblis was carrying with him all of these hooks. It was like a hook for everything. And he said to Iblis, what are these hooks that you have? And he said, shahwat, these are the desires by which uh, mankind is afflicted. And he said to Iblis, he says, do I have any of those hooks? And he said, perhaps you ate to the point of being full and I made it a burden for you to pray and to remember Allah. And then he said, do you have... He said, do I have anything else? Yahya ibn Zakari, do I have any other of these hooks? And he says, no. And so Yahya then replied to Shaytan, he says, Lillahi alayya, Allah amla abatni min al-ta'ami abadan. 
It says, for Allah, I am not going to fill my stomach with food ever again. And in response to that, Iblis, he said, Basically, then I swear by Allah, I'm not going to give good advice and counsel to a Muslim ever again. Because when they hear good advice, what do they do? What should they do? They should take it and act upon it. And this is what he's doing. He, he was told that he has one of these snares in him. He has one of these vices. And so he's gonna sever that, remove it and be free of shaitan's traps. Said that there are six qualities about eating a lot that are uh, disliked. Number one, this is Imam al Ghazali. He says, um, it removes fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your heart. Number two, it removes uh, compassion for your fellow man from your heart because you assume that everybody else is full as you are. Number three, uh, it, it makes you lethargic when you eat too much. So you cannot perform your religious duties or you struggle to do so. He says, uh, number four is if you hear something a wise advice or counsel. You don't find any eloquence in it. Uh, number five is uh, if someone is preaching or, or sharing uh, wise counsel, um, it will not enter into your heart. And number six is, or I should say here, if you are the one who is preaching or uh, teaching wise counsel, it will not enter the hearts of others. Number six is, um, it is the cause of disease and sickness. The last thing is, al-ajala. Oh, before this one is, uh, al which means cupidity. Cupidity, it's just similar to covetousness. And this is not for anything, but it's for people to have this desire uh, for people. Basically like you have attached to, have become attached to someone and you're willing to do anything to get their attention and gain their love. Your heart has become attached to someone to the point that you're willing to do anything to gain their attention and their love. And the, the least that happens here in this situation is that you're excessive in their praise. Uh, which is something that they don't even possess. They're not worthy of. You're excessive in praising them for that which they're not worthy of. And you are prevented because of this love from enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. This basically creates a misplaced devotion for someone when your devotion should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here you're willing to compromise your values so that someone will give you attention and love the last thing is ajala, which is hastiness. Um, and hastiness, of course, is uh, something that the Prophet والسلام, he says, min shaytan wa ta'anni min Allah ta'ala. Basically, that hastiness is from shaytan and deliberate, deliberateness is from Allah. Hastiness is from shaytan and deliberateness is from Allah. Uh, and essentially, what happens as we've all experienced, perhaps, being hasty leads to uh, error, leads to mistake. Um, and often ends in uh, failure and devastation. And that's where we'll conclude for today's session. Zakallah khair. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us uh, with the truth and guide us to follow it and keep us away from uh, deviation uh, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen